Hi everyone, my name is Doris Lee and I'm a product manager for Snowflake Notebooks. In this tutorial, we'll walk you through some of the core capabilities for database admins, architects, and data engineers using Snowflake Notebooks. There's going to be a lot that we'll be covering in this tutorial, including how you can load data from an S3 bucket into a Snowflake table, inspecting and comparing query performance, some of the best practices on how you can leverage built-in optimizations with Snowflake, working with semi-structured JSON data, creating a view, join, and visualize your query result, and finally, recovering from mistakes by doing time travel and rollbacks. This video is jam-packed with awesome tips on how you can efficiently query and process your data in Snowflake. So let's dive right in. Here you can see that I have my Snowflake notebook opened up. I've already established a connection, and so my notebook is active, I can start hacking away and develop some SQL queries to load in my data set. So in this case, I'm going to load in the city bike rider data set. This is a data set that's currently stored on an S3 bucket. And this is what the data set looks like. It's basically a bunch of CSV files totaling around 61 million rows. And we're going to try to load all of this data from the S3 files into our Snowflake table. So the first thing that we're going to do is just make sure that we have the right roles. We create a database called City Bike based on that. And then we want to make sure that we're using the right schema. One of the nice things about using Snowflake notebooks is that you can easily write, you know, either multiple lines of SQL or a single line of SQL, run them and, and quickly inspect sort of the results. Um, and all of your SQL queries can be run sequentially all in this notebook context. So the next step that we are doing here is we are creating a table with a particular schema based on our CSV file. And then the next thing that we want to do is, is create a stage. And the stage is linked to our public S3 bucket. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is just look at what is inside our S3 bucket. So if you do an LS or a list, you can see that there's all of these CSV files. They are separated based on dates, which captures sort of the, the city bike bike records across these different dates. So this, there are a lot of files that we would be loading in here. And then the next thing that we want to do is we want to create a CSE file format. So we can use that file format to load in the data. And you can use the show command to make sure that the file format has been correctly created. Now we finally get to the data loading part. To load the data from the stage, we can use the, the file format and then we copy that into our trips table. So you saw that earlier, there was a bunch of CSV files that needed to be loaded in. So this takes a while. And the other thing to note is that I'm using demo warehouse, which is a really small warehouse. I think it's an extra small. And so this query is going to take a long time because again, we're copying a lot of the data into the Snowflake table. One of the things I love about using Snowflake notebooks is that on the top right hand corner of every cell, I can see the SQL query that is being run. And so you can see that this SQL query is currently running. It's start time, the warehouse that it's using. And yes, it's, it's actually using this demo warehouse that is an extra small. And then I love sort of being able to take a look at, you know, the hyperlink query ID. It actually shows you, you know, your query profile, what the query is actually doing. Um, and the details of this query. Well, we can see that the query has just completed running. It's been about 57 seconds to run. And then, so we're gonna go back and take a look at, these are the CSV files that have been loaded. So obviously a lot of work that has been done here. Um, and we took a look at the query history and how you can very easily navigate to that. Now, the next thing that I, we want to do is let's say that we wipe out all the data and metadata associated with the trips table and we try to redo the loading again. So we're going to drop this table and then I'm going to do a select star just to show you that the table has been cleared. This truncate command basically drops all the content of the table. 
And what we're going to do next is we're going to alter the size of the warehouse. And I'm going to change the size of my warehouse to a large warehouse. You can see here, uh, there's this really interesting uh, syntax here. This is the Jinja syntax that is used to refer to the value of a Python variable. And the Python variable that we care about here is current warehouse name. So this dynamically fetches sort of the warehouse name. I have that printed here. The warehouse name is called demo underscore warehouse. And the nice thing about Snowflake Notebooks is that you can use this Jinja syntax to essentially read the Python variable value into your SQL query. Um, so we run this command and I wanted to show you the actual query that has been run. And we should see that this is an alter warehouse on our demo warehouse and then I set the warehouse as large. So this is actually taking the Python string and then injecting it into my SQL query. And then I can again use the show warehouse command to take a look at the information about this warehouse and the fact that it has now been changed to size, size large. And then finally, I'm going to repeat my copy command Remember, this is the command that took a, about a minute to run earlier with the extra small warehouse. Now that we have a large warehouse, let's see if this actually runs faster. Awesome. So our data has finished loading. You can see that this command only took 21 seconds to run. So it's almost a third of the time spent then compared to what we did earlier with the extra small warehouse. So changing warehouse size is an easy way of speeding up the queries that often takes a long time. You know, things like data ingestion, working with lots of data. Now, after I finished all of this, I'm going to change my warehouse back to an extra small and proceed with my analysis. So oftentimes when you're working as part of the, a team, let's say you have, you know, data loading steps, you have analytic queries and, and things like that. You create a special warehouse specific to the workload that you're doing. So in this case, like I want to create a new warehouse called analytics warehouse and then have that set as large so that I can use that to run my analytics query. So in this next section, we're going to use the analytics warehouse that we've created to run through some queries um, and, and show you some examples of how Snowflake uses caching to help speed up your queries so that you don't have to recompute the results again. So I'm going to just make sure that I'm in the right context and then run a preview to look at a sample of the data. Um, and then the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to run this analytics query, which essentially computes sort of the hourly statistics for on my city bike data set. So you can see that we've performed some sort of aggregation here to look at the number of trips, average duration, average distance for every hour. Now, if we run the exact same query again, Snowflake um, has a result cache that stores the result for every query that has been generated in the last 24 hours. And so you can see that that query, the first time it ran, it took about three seconds. You'll see that the query was successful. Um, but the second time that it ran, it only took less than a second. And this is because we are using the cached results. So you don't actually need to recompute the results here. So let's run another query. In this case, we're looking at month and, and basically aggregating based on the number of trips every month. The other thing that I find really useful is if you ever need to make a copy of your data, you can use the Snowflake clone command to create a clone of the trips data set. So in this example, I am creating the trips dev table based on by cloning the trips table. So if you navigate to the left-hand panel, as you can see in this image, I should be able to see the trips dev table that has been created. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how you can work with semi-structured data sets. In this case, I have a bunch of JSON data. 
this is what the JSON data looks like. It's basically a bunch of weather data that is stored in JSON format. And again, earlier we showed how you can load in a CSV file. In this case, we're going to show you how you can load in uh, a set of JSON files. So what we're going to do is we first created a database called the weather database. And then we are going to create weather's table. Uh, so this table is called JSON weather data. And you can see that it has a single column of a variant column and variant columns is essentially kind of uh, the way that you can work with JSON objects within your Snowflake tables. And we'll take a look at what the data actually looks like after we load it in. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do, as I have done earlier, is create a stage, again, pointing that to the S3 bucket and then listing the contents of the stage. And so instead of a bunch of CSV files this time, I have a bunch of JSON files. And these are the JSON files that I'm going to try to load into my weather's table. So now that I have you know, the JSON files, I'm going to copy all of that into my weather's table. And you can see that all of these JSON files have been loaded. Now, if I look at a preview of the result, you can see that V is the column that I've defined. Uh, this is the variance column. And every single row is essentially a JSON object. I can double click and take a look at the, the values within it. And it's a very easy way of like inspecting these results within your Snowflake notebooks. Now, Snowflake offers a very convenient way of looking at the fields, so specific fields within your columns. You can do that by this notation, the colon notation. So this V colon notation essentially allows you to refer to each of the fields in my JSON uh, column, my objects column. In this case, I'm going to create a view based on each of the fields in my weather data set. And in this case, I am filtering to a particular station. Uh, this is the weather station near the New York airport for creating this view. And you can use this view just like any table. Uh, you can use it for joins. You can run some query on it. In this case, we are filtering to a specific date and looking at the preview of the data. And again, all of these are data that is collected ne near the New York airport. So you can work with views just like you would with a regular data source. Um, and you can even do joins on it. So the next thing that we're going to do here is we have our city bikes data set and we have our weather's data set. Uh, so we're going to do a join across the two data sets. One is the view and one is the data. And we're going to do a join uh, and compute the number of trips for different weather conditions. And not surprisingly, clear days, people are more likely to do bike trips on clear days. And one of the things that I love about using Snowflake notebooks is that when I run some SQL queries, I get the result shown in my SQL cell output in my notebook. But if I want to operate it in pandas, for example, I can simply take the cell name and I can either access that as a Snowpark data frame, or in this case, I wanted to convert this into a pandas data frame. So essentially, I'm taking this SQL cell result, converting that into a pandas data frame in Python. So then I can do some analytics or do some plotting and things like that. So in this case, I'm going to use that pandas data frame and just plot sort of the value. So again, clear days, uh, lots of bike trips, you know, not so much when there's light rain, definitely not a lot when there's heavy snowfall. So this is an example of how, of how you can, you know, do some SQL querying, take the results, bring it to Python, and then do some, you know, do some visualizations or, or run some statistics on that. So in this example, we showed how you can go from a SQL query to the results as a pandas data frame, and then plotting that with the Altair library all in Python.
So in this next section, we're going to take a look at how you can do data recovery when you make inadvertent mistakes on, on your data tables. For example, let's say I accidentally dropped my table and you know, I didn't intend to drop this, but now that has happened, my data is gone. I do a select star query and it's telling me, hey, this data doesn't exist. So what do I do now? I have this command called undrop table that allows me to recover from that, uh, uh, that command of dropping the table. So you can see that after undropping this table, my data is back and has been recovered. The other thing that is useful is I can do a rollback for fetching the results of a query, uh, right before some operation is performed. So in this case, uh, let's say again, I, I made, I made some inadvertent mistake to set the station, the start station name of column as oops. So I, I made some mistake and then I updated basically every single row in this data set and it's start station name as this value. Yeah. So let's say that I made this mistake and I proceeded with running some querying. And I realize, hey, like, why is there only one station? And why is there only a, a single value? I want to recover from this mistake. So how do I roll back my table to be before when this query happened, this update query happened? So the way that I can do that is I can query the information schema and actually fetch the query ID um, that corresponds to the query right before this update clause. Now that we have this query ID, I can simply use time travel to regenerate the table with the correct station names. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm selecting the table before this query ID. So right before this update operation happened and then replacing my table, replacing my trips table based on the result of that. Now, obviously this is going to take a while because it's repopulating that table. But now that that is done, if we rerun our query, we can see not just one station name, but a bunch of different station names. And this is what we would expect from our data. So finally, we've completed all of these exercises today. We've created a bunch of Snowflake objects. So uh, what we're going to do here is just resetting our Snowflake environment and, and tear down some of the objects that we've created. So we're going to drop the database and the warehouses that we've created. In this video, uh, we demonstrated some of the common operations used by database admins and data engineers so that you can effectively manage, query, and process your data like a pro. We showed how you can do all of this inside your Snowflake notebooks using SQL cells to run through each of the st steps in your workflow sequentially. It even lets you compare query performance and inspect how your queries are doing. Notebooks is a great place for you to run everything all in one place so that you can review and look back at what you've done. No more toggling between different interfaces for working with and managing uh, your data. If you like this video, don't forget to click on our Notebooks playlist here to check out more videos like this. See you in the next video.